Welcome to Agile to Agility Podcast with Milan Bayic. Major show alert. The very first value we wrote is individuals and interactions. Let's take this to another level. So I think there's been a lot of focus in the Agile community on psychology, but the big leverage and anyone who's been, say, a, a, a commander in uh, armed forces has served <clears throat> for their country or has been a leader of any kind, whether it was the Boy Scouts or the local soccer team or anything of that nature, they will understand that the big leverage point for a leader is to understand the social dynamics of the group, it's sociology exactly. and not uh, psychology. Who is David J. Anderson? What was your journey? Instead of me just introducing you, uh, what are some of the things that maybe the audience uh, doesn't know about you? And uh, how did you get, uh, you know, where you are today? Maybe talk about some of the things that are not necessarily maybe <laughs> uh, well known. Uh, it's, it's, it's always hard to know what's well known, what isn't well known. Um, because uh, I'm sitting in my home office, it's, it's Friday afternoon, but I'll just pull this over here and you probably yeah. see this. This is a, a photograph of me, which it actually came from my mother's house after she passed away. But the other gentleman in the, the photograph is giving me an award for innovation, um, approximately 1993. And he is a cabinet minister of the United Kingdom. Uh, his name is Alan Stewart. And he was either the, the, the minister for, um, the secretary of state for Scotland, the minister for, for Scotland, or he was the minister for the Department of Trade and Industry. And I, I don't really remember, it's a long time ago. But um, I've had, uh, an interesting uh, journey. In the 1980s, as a teenager, I started out as a games developer. And back in the days when computers were 8-bit and the uh, memory sizes were 16K and uh -huh. 32, 48K, 64K, um, nowadays a typical graphic on a web page is 10 times bigger than that. So the, uh, in that period of time, all computer games were programmed in machine code assembly language. And I was fairly good at it by, the market wasn't very global back then, it was very regional. So North American computers were often not sold in Europe and vice versa. And companies that published games were largely regional. Uh, but within the European market, I was quite successful. I, I made a lot of money by the standard of a, a young kid yeah. at 18 years old. You know, two days after my 18th birthday, I walked into the local BMW dealer and purchased a new car with cash yeah. <laughs> and then paid I think 10% of the value of the car for it, for the insurance policy so that I could drive it away. <laughs> yeah. uh, so, so I did that for a while and then there was a seasonal downturn, uh, a cyclical downturn in the games industry as there was the transition from really, I guess, 16 bit to 32 bit processors. Yeah. And I, I took the opportunity to go to university where I, I studied uh, electronics and software engineering, but specifically control systems engineering. And uh, I, I almost did a PhD in wind turbine design. The, I, I was accepted to the program. And during the summer, after I'd graduated from my undergraduate, the government pulled the funding from essentially world-class wind turbine design because they believed it wasn't particularly important. Mm -hmm. You know, looking back on that now and, and around here in the Basque Country in Spain and all over Scotland, there are wind turbines everywhere. Mm -hmm. 
but the, the government had concluded that funding the research wasn't important and the research position that I'd been accepted for went away. So I got a job as a software development manager in a five-year-old startup company. Huh. And in the early 1990s, I, I did two of those jobs uh, at two different startups. Mm -hmm. Back in the days when it wasn't so easy to do startup companies, uh, certainly the, the barrier to entry was higher than it is now in terms of the, the money and particularly doing it in somewhere in Europe, the United Kingdom, it was incredibly difficult to raise money and get support for startup companies. The, mm -hmm. uh, the, the climate has changed a lot in the 30 years since then, but back then, really difficult. So after five years or so of doing that and being close to personally bankrupt, uh, I took a job as a, a contract programmer at IBM in the PC company division. And I worked mm -hmm. there for a couple of years. I did a couple of different things. I worked on their, uh, what ultimately became their e-commerce website, but it started out as a Lotus Notes project to wire up dealerships so that people could walk into a dealer, sit down at a computer at a desk, configure the PC they wanted to buy, and then custom order it from the factory. And during the time we were doing the project, that transitioned into a, a website so that people could go on to pc.ibm.com, configure the PC they wanted, and essentially custom order it from the factory. Yeah. And I wrote little bits of code there, really you know, quirky things, things that would put the price on the, the you, know, you made a page of configured your PC and now it has to display the price. And little things like the internationalization of that, figuring out which currency symbol to put on it and whether it went before the number or after the number, depending yeah. on the region. Uh, so I did that for about a year. And then the following year, I moved into another group that did BIOS code where I could use my assembly language skills. And I wrote diagnostic software for for IBM PC servers. Uh, so if you worked in an investment bank and you'd bought a whole bunch of IBM PCs, what was the value in buying a high quality, genuine IBM PC versus some other, you know, copycat thing? Well, part mm. of it was just the sheer engineering of them. I used to sit in the same lab where the guys that designed the circuit boards and the, the, the amount of skill and detail that went into ensuring that the, the, the um, were robust to noise, electronic noise. Mm -hmm. And just generally that they didn't have any hot spots on the circuit board, they wouldn't overheat, they wouldn't fail and so on. There was a huge amount of attention to detail to that in comparison to some random um, clone PC that you might buy. So they were selling the reliability. And in addition to that, if something was beginning to go wrong, the PC was capable of self-diagnosing. Mm -hmm. I'm a bit sick and then reporting it to some administrator uh, or the administrator was capable of sending some magic packet through the ethernet that would wake up the PC and run a self-diagnostic program. Yeah. And I wrote a bunch of that code. I wrote code for self-diagnosing the ethernet port, for example, whether it yeah. was working correctly. So, I, and I did that job primarily just to fix my bank balance at the time, you know, pay off my uh, debts. And while I was there, uh, an ex-IBM guy contacted me and offered me the chance to move to Singapore. Yeah. Because inside IBM, I had a reputation as someone who was very knowledgeable about user interface design and product design. And uh, an IBM project in Singapore at the United Overseas Bank 
needed someone with that skill. Mm -hmm. And they offered me a contract to quit IBM, go work there. And that's how I got involved in the Agile movement. Because on that project, we had the, the project director, a guy called Jeff DeLuca, Australian guy. And he brought in a well-known American expert on object-oriented analysis and design called Peter Code. Yeah. And together, what emerged out of that, together, the two of them, they designed the, the process we would use on this project. And that was known as feature-driven development back in the days when all of this was called lightweight methods. Yeah, it's interesting. Uh, I've been talking so to I, so... I was there for a couple yeah. of years. I spoke with John Kerr. And that's uh, how I got involved in what became the Agile movement. Mm -hmm. And after that, I, uh, I left Singapore. I moved to the United States. I briefly worked at a consulting company in Dallas that was well known. There are a few other people that are quite well known, like Luke Coleman and Craig Larman had worked there. Mm -hmm. um, but it, it was a toxic environment. It was really a horrible place to work. Mm -hmm. And fairly soon after I'd arrived in Dallas, I, I got a call from a guy, a new English guy. And he, he told me that Sprint the American telecom company based in Kansas City, were looking for someone who could design wireless applications. Back in those days, mm -hmm. the technology was called WAP, wireless application, something. Like that. Yeah. <laughs> and the, uh, I, so I went there to do that, and I was only there about oh, five or six weeks. The internet business unit at, at, at Sprint called SprintPCS.com. And there was some internal management crisis and the woman who'd hired me had quit her job and had a big fight with the vice president. And five or six other managers had all quit and left with her. And I got called into the corner office because the boss had noticed something that I'd said. Some, I was advocating for the use of feature-driven development in some situation. Uh, and he called me into the corner office to talk to me about it. That was fine. Went back to my desk, got on with doing the design work I was doing. But two days later, I got called back to the corner office and he had a flip chart in the corner somewhere, some scribbles on it. It looked like a terrible mess. But if you looked carefully, it was like an organization chart. And he had one of these wooden pointer sticks, you know, and he slapped it against this and said, pointing at one of the boxes in the chart and said, I want you to manage this department uh, because there's a lack of leadership in this business unit and you've got command presence. You're a natural leader. I want you to do this. And it was, there was no pay rise in it. There was no change in pay grade. And from, from having 15, 20, 30 emails a day. My inbox went to 500 emails every day. So in some ways I was crazy to take the job, but it, it, it seemed like the right thing to do. Yeah. And that's how I, I got into management in big corporates at Sprint and then at Motorola. A bit later after that, I worked at Microsoft for a while. But is it at Microsoft that position. you, yeah, when did you uh, kind of start thinking about Kanban and uh, when did the idea for uh, Kanban method? The, um, yeah, the idea for Kanban, that came a little before I went to Microsoft. Yeah. Uh, but I was already at Microsoft when my phone rang one day, it was a manager in the IT department. And he'd seen me posting on some internal news group. Yeah. Uh, I think it, it was at the time when Microsoft were developing Windows Vista, mm -hmm. which uh, ultimately got canceled and replaced with Windows 7. And some of the groups on the, the Vista development were experimenting with agile methods. And it wasn't going terribly well from a, middle and senior management perspective, it wasn't going well. 
and someone had posted on this internal news group with basically a help message. Is there anyone out there who might be able to help us because the middle management junior ranking executives are freaking out and we're, we're going to get into big trouble if we can't turn this around. Mm -hmm. And I'd responded to this, that's a whole separate story. Uh, but this had brought me to the attention of this IT guy who called me up and, and he said, hey, you know, it, it's really a coincidence, but I'm reading this book right now by some guy called David Anderson. And, and then here you are at Microsoft and you're replying about these agile things and helping people in the company on agile stuff. And you're also called David Anderson. <laughs> and and I, I replied to him and said, yes, that's right. I am David Anderson. <laughs> He said, yeah, it's such a coincidence. I've got this book by this guy and he's got the same name as you. And I'm like, no, I am David Anderson. <laughs> and, it, and it took three or four iterations of this before he said, what do you mean exactly? I said, you're reading my book. And he said, but it says you work at Motorola. I said, yeah, well, that was three months ago. Now I work here. <laughs> uh, so that's how we got started with Kanban. Yeah. That uh, a very brave guy with a, a really interesting background, right? former Olympic athlete, um, stuntman in the movies, owned his own uh, fitness center, um, then somehow started working at a, 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 a mental hospital, basically, a hospital for. Um, you know, for yeah. people with uh, psychiatric uh, problems. Uh, he started working there as a janitor and two years wow. later, he was the general manager. Wow. <laughs> and then he quit that job and he got a job as a project manager at Great Plains Software. Great Plains was then acquired by Microsoft and he ended up in Microsoft's IT, IT division right. working as project manager. Uh, so pretty interesting character, and it turned out that he had volunteered to take over the department with the worst customer service record in the whole of Microsoft. Mm -hmm. And the position had been vacant for several months because nobody wanted the job. And he called me up and said, do you think you can help? And that's how we got started with, with Kanban. I went to talk to him. and. He told me what he thought was wrong with his department, and I suggested a few things. We tried them out. And 15 months later, we had trebled the productivity of that department, reduced their average delivery time from five and a half months to 11 days, and improved their on-time delivery from 0% to 98%. And the consequence of that was that uh, he got promoted. Eventually, the, the general manager of that business unit moved to become the CIO at Avanad and then later at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and took him with him. His name was Dragos Dimitriou. And we both won uh, an award from Microsoft for, for the, the improvement that had happened there. And that also mm. happens to be just lying here on my shelf. I found this when I moved to Spain. It was in a box somewhere. You can see this uh -huh. from 2005. And uh -huh. this is the, the Microsoft. At that time, Microsoft's IT division was organized into seven different groups, mm -hmm. uh, six for each of Microsoft's profit and loss businesses like Windows and Office, developer tools, and, and so on. And then the seventh one was for cross-functional things like finance, uh, um, HR mm -hmm. services, uh, security, facilities management, that type of thing. They were known yeah. as XIT. So this is the, the, the XIT Best Practice Award. Nice. 2005, signed by, signed by Dale Christian, the general manager, who later became the CIO at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. So, nice. so maybe to uh, that's, what, uh, yeah. that's how the Kanban thing came about. 
What kind of and, uh, uh, what... after a couple of years at Microsoft, I kind of yeah. done my job there. And Bill Gates owns a, another company. It's <clears throat> at the time it's called Corbis, and nowadays it's yeah. um, called Ben, I think. Yeah. Um, Business Entertainment Network or some uh, something yeah. like that. Uh, and they have a brand called Greenlight, but at the time Corbis was, along with Getty Images, one of the two largest stock photography businesses in the world, mm. licensing imaging. Oh, and yeah, I remember. Th they got a new CIO and he approached me. I think some other people at Corbis had said some things about what I was doing at Microsoft and that it might be interesting. Mm -hmm. And he approached me to take the job as the head of software engineering there. And I, I looked at where I was in Microsoft and if you like Bill Gates at the top and Steve uh. Palmer and then and I was down here somewhere. <laughs> and at Corbis, there was like me, the CIO and Bill Gates. Yeah. And I got a, a department with 150 people in it to run. And that became a, a huge Kanban experiment, basically, simply yeah. because I wanted to pursue this, this approach of we start with what you do now and we evolve from there, that I don't turn up and install some agile method. So and maybe I want to uh, I want to explore that a little bit. Like, so is it true that Kanban method is structured to address the, the that human tendency? Uh, to resist change, because that's that's really you know I think what you've overemphasized. But how, why was uh, what how, what was was going? I guess what has your experience been to make sure that that's important to start with where, where you are. So at the time, it was largely gut feeling and observation, and. Mm -hmm. um, some stuff I'd read, Peter Senge's book, The Fifth Discipline, he, he talks about the idea that people don't resist change, they resist being changed. And my observation at both Sprint and at Motorola, when we tried to scale the use of some agile method, it began to meet with resistance. Mm -hmm. And the results were, they were all right, but they were lackluster. Mm -hmm. And roughly speaking, if we look at the people who reported to me directly and the improvement they made, it was typically two and a half to five times better than the improvements we saw in other departments. And the resistance manifested as that's all very well for you guys at the end of the corridor down there, but our situation is completely different and whatever you're doing down there, it's not going to work here. Yeah. And after I'd heard that a few times over two or three years, it, it, I began to think, all right, there's a pattern here. Mm -hmm. And while I was writing that first book, the one that Dragos had been reading when, when I arrived at Microsoft, uh, it had occurred to me I was writing the wrong book, solving the wrong problem. And what we really needed was largely to abandon agile methods because it didn't matter what your agile method was or whether it was better than whatever you thought some software development lifecycle process from the past might, might be. It didn't matter. People were going mm -hmm. to resist. They didn't respond to logical argument that, well, this is logically better, you should, so you should do it. And fundamentally, that's because they're not robots. That they have what Daniel Kahneman referred to as system one as well as system mm -hmm. two. System two is the prefrontal cortex, your logical um, brain, the, the part of your brain that Plato referred to as logos. Uh, thinking uh, and if fast you're a and robot, slow, right? Yeah, exactly. Thinking fast and slow. If you were a robot, then uh, you would agree that the argument for whatever agile method you want to pick is strong and we should just do it. But we're dealing with human beings and they have a system one 
actually what Plato referred to as as thymos and eros, or or in the in the Republic, um, his book, the Republic, uh, book one. Uh, but by book four, where he was considering the human soul, he renamed it to um, uh, epithymos. So the system two is epithymos and thymos, not thymos and eros. So you've got lo uh, logos, epithymos, and thymos. And it turns out that this Plato is working two and a half thousand years ago. Mm -hmm. He, he empirically observed the architecture of the human brain as we understand it today, as neuroscientists understand it, that epithymos, I mean, literally epi means like before the thymos or in control of the thymos. Yeah. It's really and like, a, it's our the, limbic uh, brain. The right? hypothalamus. Well, the hypothalamus is epithymos. Yeah. And... Thymos is the amygdala and the hippocampus. And thymos is, is the desire, it's the appetite. Uh, sorry, epithymos is the desire, it's the appetite, it's the cerebral controller. So if you're hungry, your uh, hippocampus tells you to eat something. Mm -hmm. And if it's working correctly, after you've had something to eat, it says, stop eating. It's a control system and it controls any sort of desire or appetite. Then the, the hippocampus and the amygdala, on the other hand, they, they are much more involved in pattern matching and your sense of identity, your sense of who you are, um, your uh, self-esteem, your status, your dignity, your level of self-respect, where you relate to socially with other people uh, and so forth. And this is all stuff that, that I've researched and used and published recently in the Kanban Maturity Model book. So back in 2002, three, four, I didn't have the scientific explanation. Uh, and to be honest, Plato and neuroscience together go further than, than Daniel Kahneman goes. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's not just system one and system two, it's like system one can be subdivided into subsystems. Uh, and that's important. And then we, we find we can also map that to Maslow's hierarchy, that low level Maslow hierarchy needs like safety, security, mm -hmm. physiological needs. And to some extent, a sense of belonging, they, they map to the hypothalamus, uh, to epithymos. And then from sense of belonging up through self-actualization, uh, the, the, the higher level Maslow hierarchy needs map to, the, to thymos, to the, uh, the hippocampus and the amygdala. And, and, and so mm -hmm. someone comes along and says, so we don't value your Gantt charts anymore. We are sending you to a two day training class and you're gonna come back as a scrum master. Um, that, that, in, that attacks someone's thymos, it, it attacks, it, the, that attack is felt first by the amygdala, it pattern matches that as a threat mm -hmm. and it sends a signal to the hippocampus that said, we're being threatened. And the hippocampus invokes what's called the hyperarousal response, which we typically refer to as the fight or flight, flight response. Yeah, exactly. And yeah. if that's severe, that's called flooding. And uh, mm -hmm. when your brain is flooded, you're either like deer in yeah. the headlight <laughs> stuck or yeah. you fight or you run away. And by preference, we like to run away unless we're constrained, in which case we have to fight. So, so maybe, uh, can we pause here? Out, uh, uh, can we pause? Because I want to explore this, because uh, if you think about the whole agile movement, we really haven't spent a lot of time understanding people. We like understand the, and try to understand the processes. 
what is your current take on how the agile community has exactly you know done that like you know how much have we focused to uh, uh on that process side versus like understanding people and the agile manifesto is really all about people so could you maybe just share your thoughts on on like uh, the current state yeah, of that's agile a good question and, so uh, the I think there's a lot of emphasis in the agile movement on people as individuals and a lot of people who have this very individualistic uh, yeah. uh, self-image belief. And there's a focus on psychology. There's a lot of agile coaches that have this self-image that they're dilettante therapists. Yeah. <laughs> um, and actually, as early as 2005, I blogged about what's really different about Agile. And some Agilists had talked about, well, we're very people-centric and we focus on psychology, to which um, I wonder if I have it on my shelf. Ah, it's here. I don't know where it was, but it's right here. This is Jerry Weinberg's Psychology of Computer Programming. And you see how old this looks. Well, the book's actually, I think, from 1971. It was written mostly in the late 60s. Yeah, published in 71. My personal copy is from 1984, bought in the University of Strathclyde bookshop in Glasgow, um, although I wasn't actually attending the university at the time. Um, so psychology wasn't new. Mm -hmm. And then what about iterative and incre incremental stuff? And well, there was Tom Guild's evil method and Barry Bones' spiral method. And uh, arguably, Edwards Deming's methods were iterative and incremental. So none of that was new either. So was Agile not actually new? Yeah. What was new and different about Agile? The conclusion I came to was it was an understanding of sociology. It was a focus on groups of people. Now, most of the Agile movement will talk about teams, but why not? The, the dictionary definition of team is a group of individuals who align around a common goal. Mm -hmm. So that could be 2,000 people. Team could be 2,000 people, the dictionary definition. And that's actually how I used the word team in the Kanban book. But mm -hmm. I realized most Agile people reading it don't understand that. So actually the big leverage and the understanding of the, the human condition is to recognize that we're social animals. So mm -hmm. I think there's been a lot of focus in the Agile community on psychology, but the big leverage and anyone who's been say a, a, a commander in uh, armed forces has served <clears throat> for their country or has been a leader of any kind, whether it was the Boy Scouts or the local soccer team or anything of that nature, they will understand that the big leverage point for a leader is to understand the social dynamics of the group, it's sociology exactly. and not uh, psychology. Mm -hmm. So a lot of what I've built into the Kanban method from the very beginning, and I did it almost without thinking about it because I've been reading this stuff separately, uh, is sociologically aware. And more recently, we've looked, we, me, being me and some of my uh, colleagues like Andreas Bartel and Alexei Zegloff, uh, Teodoro Bozeva, we've looked at social psychology, which is this weird hybrid thing um, social psychology, its definition is <clears throat> the, the, the psychological impact on an individual as they experience social change. And social psychologists divide change into four basic categories. Category one is stability, there's no change. Category yeah. two is inertia. People are frustrated, but change doesn't happen. Category three, they call incremental change, which coincidentally I called Kanban incremental change in the beginning. Yeah. I didn't use the word evolutionary for a few years. And then the fourth category is called dramatic social change. 
And dramatic social change is wherever you make some structural change in the sociology of a group. So if yeah. you give someone a new job title, if you change the way they relate to other people, if you give them a change in their pay grade, their status, their recognition, any of these things, it changes the social order. And it turns out that thymos doesn't like that. Mm -hmm. that our amygdala is wired up to, co to cope with the existing social order. And mostly we, we focus on optimizing being a good version of ourselves and understanding how we relate to other people in some network, some society. And we get yeah. good at that. And if someone comes along and says, everything's changing, the social order is being changed, then our thymos, our limbic brain, our amygdala, hippocampus, and, and hypothalamus in combination respond to that as an attack. Well, that's the and thing. And can you really some form? Yeah. Can you really uh, of, can you really understand of sociology? arousal response? There might be a little delay. Uh, as I was saying. Uh, can you can you really uh, understand sociology without? understanding psychology. So if you don't understand psychology of people, individuals, and uh, uh, how can you understand at the collective level as a social psychology or sociology? So, the, the, yeah, these things are not well related. So when I first heard the term social psychology, I thought that's very weird. They're basically saying that some collective psyche yeah. But actually, the definition of social psychology is a lot weaker than that. It's just simply mm -hmm. the understanding of how individuals experience change, social change psychologically. So social psychology is still psychology. It's not sociology. Yeah. And understanding how human brains react to social phenomenon is actually really important. So when Peter Senge said people do not resist change, they resist being changed, he's talking about sociology. Mm -hmm. That your identity, who you are, is defined by how you relate to everyone else. So imagine that you, you weren't a parent, right? And I know before we started, you were talking about you have a four-year-old. So there was a time in your life when you weren't a parent and now you are. Mm -hmm. And the day that your first child was born, you became a parent that fundamentally changed who you are as a person because mm -hmm. the social structure was changed. Mm -hmm. Now, you didn't mention whether you have a, uh, more than one child. Yeah. No, I only have, we only have, have him right now. Yeah, no, just one. one. Yeah. <laughs> so the, um, the, you may have noticed, though, when you're in the hospital, the doctors, particularly the doctors, sometimes the nurses, when they first talk to you, they'll say, first child. <laughs> and the reason why that's important is your behavior as a parent will be much different if it's your first child versus your second, your third, your fourth, and so on. Like, if it's your first child, you will be freaking out. And the reason you're freaking out is your whole world has changed and your brain is being rewired. Now, in, in my case, the second one came along two and a half years later, and some of my colleagues had warned me, oh, the second one is very boring, you know. <laughs> the, uh, the first one was all panic, and the second one, we were so calm. Anyway, the, the thing about the second one, it, for any, uh, uh, any family, the first child and the parents, how do they experience the arrival of the second child? Mm -hmm. Well, for the parents, it's huh, another child. <laughs> it's actually just a scaling problem. It's not a structural change. You're already a parent and now you've got two. It's a scaling problem. And in social psychology, that's known as a normative change. But when you had your first child, that's known as a structural change. And your That's brain strange. reacts differently to structural changes than normative changes. But what about the first child when the second child arrives? 
the structural the change. The first child <laughs> freaks out because it's a structural change. It's yeah. like, who's this other little thing? And why is it getting all the attention? And what about me? I'm not getting attention anymore. Mm -hmm. So when the second child arrives, the first child experiences it as a structural change, but the parents experience it as a normative change. And this is a really important thing in the workplace. You can make what appears to be a normative change, maybe for your testers, your programmers, but it's a structural change for someone else in, in the environment, for a project manager or a program manager, product manager, whatever. And one of the things we teach people who coach Kanban is to be able to see these things and anticipate them in advance, to anticipate who's going to react with essentially a fight or flight crisis type of response because it's a structural change for them versus other people for whom it's only a normative change. Mm -hmm. So to get back to 2004 or thereabouts, Agile methods were basically coming along and saying, throw out whatever crap you've been doing before, that's for dinosaurs from the 20th century, and install our new lightweight, sleek frameworks that come with new funky job titles and, and so on. Hmm. And pretty much everyone receiving that is receiving it as a dramatic structural change that throws them into psychological crisis. Mm -hmm. And psychologists use the word crisis very specifically. They're talking about the hyperarousal response in the, the, the hypothalamus. So if you're trying to lead change in an organization effectively and smoothly and get things done, you want to avoid sending human beings into crisis and avoid a hyper arousal fight or fight fight or flight response. Mm -hmm. You want to avoid that as much as possible. Therefore, start with what you do now and introduce changes that are going to be received by the vast majority of people in the organization as normative changes, changes in how they do something or what they do, but don't, as a consequence, they don't directly affect the social structure. Mm -hmm. They don't change, they, they could be scaling issues. You know, your second child arrived, your third child arrived, scaling issues. But fundamentally, you're still a parent. And if you were a runner, say you used to sprint 100 meters and then you went to middle distance and then you switched to marathon running, you're still a runner. Mm -hmm. That your identity hasn't changed dramatically. You're a runner, but that what you run has changed. And that level of psychological adjustment in who I am as a person and my identity is much less than say giving up running and taking up tennis. Mm -hmm. Now, with my children, the, the older one, delightful young lady who's now studying at Tulane University in New Orleans um, in I guess microbiology pre-med. Mm -hmm. uh, she was a gymnast, but she would have described herself as a typical teenage girl who does gymnastics and occasionally wins a competition. Yeah. My younger daughter, on the other hand, played in the Seattle Youth Symphony Orchestra and from time to time has been the leader of the orchestra, the, the, the first chair and the first violin, the concert master of the orchestra. And at points in, the, in her career, she was playing with um, uh, uh, string quartet in the, um, I'm momentarily forgetting the name for mm. the, uh, the, um, the, the come back, school yeah. of the music. Yeah. Uh, and in this quartet, the conductor asked her, to play the, vi the viola because they didn't have a viola player of a suitable standard um, that particular winter. 
So now she had to carry around this viola. And at every opportunity, she's complaining, oh, I hate this viola, it's so big and clunky and all oh, the music's so slow and boring, it's so easy, you know, but I have to do it, I have to do it for the team. Yeah. Uh, so the thing was that my younger daughter, her identity was violin player. And more than that, like a very good violin player, one who's sitting at the front of the orchestra and is vying for the top spot. And when she got demoted to the second chair, she would work her little ass off for three or four yeah. months to try and get back to the top spot again. So one of them has this very resilient and robust identity of I'm a teenager who does stuff like gymnastics and I just happen to be a bit good at it now and again. And the other one has this very fragile identity of I'm a violinist and don't ever ask me to play the viola. Something, okay, yeah. <laughs> Where if, if her identity was I'm a musician who happens to play the violin, but I'm okay with viola, I'm okay with piano, I'm okay with whatever, whatever. Um, yeah. That that's a much easier position to lead change there. Mm -hmm. So, sociology and psychology both have a part to play, and the coaching level thing is to be able to understand someone's identity and their sense of themselves, and then how mm -hmm. that relates into the rest of the environment. So when we're teaching Kanban coaches how to go out into an organization and lead this evolutionary change, we're teaching them, first of all, to anticipate uh, what will be a normative change for someone and what will be a structural change for someone else. And as you get to know people, try to build this picture of their identity whether it's this very narrow identity, like I'm a violinist, don't ask me to play another instrument, or mm -hmm. a, a much more general identity of I'm a musician and I don't mind picking up whichever instrument you give me. And if mm -hmm. you've got that second type of person, that's going to be so much easier to work with. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's, it's very interesting. And uh, it's really also... Uh, uh, good to to just have that reinforcement of understanding the people um that's not necessarily what you know there are a lot of myths about kanban method uh what do you think maybe as we kind of we have maybe five ten minutes here um what do you think are some of the myths about uh kanban method that you would like to clarify um what current myths that you see in uh, in the workspace or work environment or in the agile space uh, yeah there's a lot of shallow <laughs> information out there mm. uh, and some of it's not wrong it's just not enough so you can use kanban systems in a very mechanical sort of way for improving service delivery for reducing the work in progress and making things more predictable and of course, you, if you want to have a more detailed Kanban board, one that has multiple columns on it, you need a process that's mature enough that you've got that definition. Mm -hmm. um, so we see people who will say things like, well, you can't use it for poorly defined processes, but actually you can. You just have one big fat column and you slide the tickets across based mm -hmm. on how done do you think it is. Um, so there's a lot of myths out there, and in general, I would encourage people to challenge the myths with show me the evidence or to look for, for the, the evidence that refutes the myth. So myths like Kanban is only for IT operations. Well, what were we doing with it right at the beginning, software development? Yeah. Exactly. Right. And Kanban won't work on big projects. Well, 2007 already, we published a case study with a 55-person project with uh, uh, just for that, that part of the program, mm -hmm. I think 11 million US dollar budget. And the, generally, all the myths are easily refuted with existing evidence. And some of that evidence is 10, 12, 15 years old. 
Mm-hmm. Um, but the a lot of the Kanban is only for should be replaced with Kanban is for and because it's not wrong to say that Kanban works well for IT operations or Kanban works well for people with well-defined processes or it works well for service delivery problems. All of these things are true, mm-hmm. but generally the person who's promoting the myth is trying to box it into Kanban only works over here because I want you to do something else over, over here. here. Yeah. And the, 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 um, the myth promoters are generally self-serving. That, mm-hmm. That's the... Um, or don't, don't fully understand, at least in my so, experience, they don't fully understand Kanban. And so it's easy to say like, oh, this is my perception of it. Uh, this is what my consultant have told me. This is maybe what I read. But uh, a lot of times what I run into is just lack of understanding. And I think that's also fair. And yeah. the, however, the, the person receiving the information also has some professional responsibility to validate the information and not just take someone else's word for it. Mm-hmm. Don't read some random blog post by someone you really don't know and assume that it's uh, gospel truth. Uh, however, recognize that the, um, the the first person had some self-serving motive. The second person received it, just took it as the gospel truth and then repeated it simply because they want to share the information or because they, they want to look more knowledgeable than the next guy. Um, and therefore there's, there's fault on both sides. There's fault with the, the, the myth creators and there's fault with the people who re- repeat it because they should have a professional responsibility to do a little bit more digging on their the the references and evidence before you start going telling someone that you that you have some expertise in something perhaps you should acquire that expertise it's not an unreasonable expectation um but there's a the unfortunately the the standards are very low Mm -hmm. and Kanban's not the only thing that suffers from a lot of myths. What do you think maybe as a last question? The flip side of it is I don't think it does any harm. Mm -hmm. So the the people who have a shallow understanding of Kanban because they've heard some shallow version of it, some mythical version, if they still use that, I think it will still be very effective. It doesn't appear to do a lot of harm. It's just that there's a lot more opportunity on the table. Mm-hmm. So what are some of the things, uh, I know you've uh, just published uh, the Kanban maturity model. What are some of the things as a last thing maybe that you wanna invite people to check out? Um, things that you guys are doing at Kanban University and through your other initiatives and companies. Um, what message is a kind of last uh, thing here as we're wrapping up? What would you invite people to check out and do maybe a little bit more research on? Or So the, the Oracle for Kanban is our online uh, subscription service called KMM Plus, mm-hmm. KMM.plus, it's the URL. And if you're ever in a in a pub argument about what Kanban is, what it isn't, what it can do, what it can't do. You want to be able to be on your mobile phone and pull up KMM Plus. It is the definitive material. So it's it's everything that's in the new Kanban maturity model book and quite a lot more, which uh, hasn't been published elsewhere, at, at least so far. And it is the, the definitive reference and then we also have a much more accessible new publication, just the official guide to the Kanban method, which is available as a free download. It's about 20 pages. It's very colorful, lots of little cartoons and metaphors, very accessible material. So if someone wants a very basic, what is Kanban? The 
the official guide to the Kanban method available from the kanban.university website. And if you want to be able to settle the score in any pub argument about what Kanban is or isn't, or what myths may or may not be uh, true, the KMM Plus is the oracle of, of that information. Uh, okay. And I would encourage you to check both of those out. Great. Well, thank you, David. Uh, uh, this has been uh, really uh, fun for me, especially, you know, I wanted to get your thoughts on some of the human side and the uh, culture and soci uh, sociology side of things. And uh, this was really good and also refreshing yeah. to hear from your perspective how important that is, because I think that's something that people don't fully understand or maybe they're not as serious. So thank you for taking the time today with me and uh, I hope to talk sure. to you. All of this stuff we, yeah, this stuff we talked about, about the human condition, it's in the KMM book, it's in KMM Plus, it's section four of the book, it's chapter 16 through 19, uh, 16 through 18 really, 19 yeah. is about barriers to adoption. Um, so, so there's three chapters in the book, very accessible, easy to get to on KMM Plus, all this stuff I talked about, Plato, Kahneman, neuroscience, sociology, psychology, social psychology, it's all contained in there if someone's curious to follow up on, on our conversation.